All right, everyone, welcome back to the land of Kem. I am your host and the author. My name is Jeffrey Drum. Thank you all so much for joining me again. All right, everyone, welcome back. This is episode 128, and today I will be discussing a topic that has been one of the most highly requested here on the channel and something that I serendipitously discovered during my recent research on the Pyramid of Winis. Ladies and gentlemen, it is finally time to reveal my hypothesis on the function of the Serapium. And yes, I will continue to say it as it is pronounced here in Egypt, Serapium. If this is the type of content you're interested in regarding the ancient technology of a lost civilization utilizing physics and chemistry, and the function of the Egyptian pyramids and other ancient structures from across the world, this is the channel for you. So please subscribe to The Land of Chem here on YouTube and don't forget to click that little notification bell so that you do not miss the new episodes of Premiere twice per week. Please like, comment, share, and stay tuned if you want to help support this channel and get access to exclusive research and unreleased footage that you will not see anywhere else. Check out the members only channel and thelandofchem.com if you want to pick up a copy of the book or grab some merch. Today, I'm rocking my wife Alexa's new t-shirts that are available on her channel. I'll put a link to her store in the video description below. If you want to follow me on Instagram, my handle is at the land of Kim. Also, don't forget, after you finish watching this video, please go subscribe to our two new channels here on YouTube, Egyptian Trash Cats, for all you cat lovers out there, and Egypt Eats for food reviews. Ladies and gentlemen, as always, <laughs> thank you all so much for the support. I think that is it for today's intro, so without further ado, Let's get right to it. Now, just a quick reminder, the second 2024 Land of Chem Ancient Alchemy and Ascension Tour is on and bookings are now available. If you're interested in coming to Egypt to see the pyramids for yourself on this epic adventure experience coming up in early winter later this year, including an exploration of the Serapium, please send me an email to contact at thelandofchem.com with the subject line Egypt Tour 3 and I will send you the full tour itinerary and pricing details. Thank you all so much, and I will see you soon here in the land of Kem. Now, before we begin, a point of clarification and elaboration on a statement that I made in episode 127 regarding the function of the Queen's Chamber shafts. And I will quote myself here regarding the Northern shaft. Quote, unfortunately, they were not able to fully navigate the complex turns of the northern shaft, so we still don't know what may be found inside of that shaft, end quote. And later in the video that my hypothesis, quote, is of course all contingent on a more thorough exploration of the northern shaft, end quote. Let's start with my first statement regarding the preliminary investigation of the northern shaft, which was ceased and I will quote directly from Rudolf Gattenbrink here in this statement that Gattenbrink attempted a survey of the northern shaft a few days later, but the attempt was abandoned as he was afraid the robot might get stuck. Quote from Gattenbrink here, the temptation is great to send the robot around the sharp bend at 18 meters, but since our short guide rods have suddenly turned up missing, the danger is too great that the robot might get stuck and might not be able to return. End quote. Now, on to my second statement regarding a more thorough investigation being required. After my video was published, I received an Instagram message from Matt at Ancient Architects, and he and I have been in touch a good bit over the past few months after he featured some of my Sunday site visit footage in one of his recent episodes, and we have since begun to develop a bit of a camaraderie and friendship. And he sent me this episode from his channel regarding the findings of the 2002 and 2011 investigations of the northern shaft to make sure I was aware of these secondary investigations, which of course I was, first and foremost because I do my homework for these episodes, and second because I've been a huge fan and follower of his exceptional research for quite some time, and I watched this episode when it was first released. And this video and the results presented within it corroborate exactly what I said in my second statement that a more thorough exploration is required to either 
validate or negate my hypothesis about the function of these shafts. First, in a feature known as Sibson's window, which you can see here, which was not explored. And second, they did not drill through this block like they did in the southern shaft to reveal what is on the other side, those two copper loops. So how does this further exploration required apply to my hypothesis? So the transmitter block in the southern shaft does not require any external connection to produce the ultrasound wave, as explained in episode 127. However, the northern receiver block in the northern shaft would require an external connection to monitor the fluctuations in the ultrasound waves propagating through the dilute solution of sulfuric acid. So here's how the modern receiver works. The ultrasound waves are emitted on this end from the transmitter crystal. They propagate through the solution. The ultrasound waves generate an electrical signal inside of the receiving crystal that is connected to the external monitor. So within the queen's chamber, the copper electrodes embedded into the northern blocking stone wouldn't just be curved loops on the other side. They would be wires extending through the body of the pyramid and out of the structure. The strength of the electrical discharge transmitted through those wires would then tell the operator on the outside what was going on inside of the system. Now, proving or disproving my hypothesis would require, and I will quote myself once again, quote, a more thorough investigation of the northern shaft, end quote, by drilling through that block to see what is on the other side. So I just wanted to provide a bit more detail on this northern shaft and correct any miscommunication in what I was trying to convey regarding the need for further exploration. And a huge shout out and thank you to Matt from Ancient Architects, first for watching my back to make sure I had all the details, and second for your recognition and support of my work. And I look forward to collaborating on some projects in the future, and I will put a link to his Ancient Architects episode in the video description below. All right, ladies and gentlemen, with that being said, this is an absolutely major episode. Here we go with tonight's video. And to begin, I'm about to show you a short clip from Members Only Episode 6, where I explain the function of the Avebury Serpent Temple Complex, including the Beckhampton and West Kennet Stone Avenues which you can see here and here, as these will be directly relevant to the hypothesis on the Serapium presented in today's episode. And I wanna make one thing crystal clear, that these stone circle systems like Avebury and their counterparts in the Egyptian pyramids are not batteries. Let me say that one more time. They are not batteries. They are attractors, and conduits for lightning strikes, and distributors and transformers of the associated electric currents and electric fields. And if you aren't a member, here is a preview of the type of content that you will get with your exclusive subscription. I hope you enjoy. The electric field will also be sent down each of the Stone Avenue conduits, allowing it to flow here and here toward each termination, the head and the tail of this serpent temple complex. So now let's start with the electric field being distributed into the ground and into the water table surrounding the structure with an explanation of a very simple application, electroculture. And I will quote here, Electroculture is described as the stimulation of growth in plants by the means of electricity passed into the atmosphere surrounding them or into the soil in which they are growing. There was a surge in research in the late 1800s through the early 1900s 
particularly due to earlier observations which tied electrical storms to improved plant growth. Further research determined that lightning fixes atmospheric nitrogen into a solid form, nitrates, which then dissolves into raindrops and enters the soil system. This was undoubtedly responsible for the reported improvement in plant growth after electrical storms. And this pretty much sums up application number one for these complex lightning storm generator and capacitor systems. But this is just the beginning. Take a look at this. And I will quote here the title of this article, Electric Field Mediated Chemistry, Uncovering and Exploiting the Potential of Oriented Electric Fields to Exert Chemical Catalysis and Reaction Control. And here from the abstract, this perspective discusses oriented external electric fields known as OEEF and other type of electric fields as quote unquote smart reagents, which enable in principle control over a wide ranging aspects of reactivity and structures. These OEEFs, oriented external electric fields, will accelerate reactions, control regio selectivity, induce spin state selectivity, and elicit mechanism crossovers. So recall that there are other structures connected into the landscape surrounding this serpent temple complex, such as the West Kennet Long Barrow. And these electric fields could not only have facilitated the chemical reactions occurring within, but would also have been effectively harnessed by the dielectric ferrous sulfate product that they were creating, which I have shown has a dielectric constant of more than double that of the limestone used in the Egyptian pyramids, making it extremely effective in storing electric fields. And this opens the door to an immense topic of discussion when we will return to the Egyptian pyramids to discuss the roles of these electric fields within the chemical reactions in those reactors. And I found it interesting that they chose to use an image of lightning bolts stimulating the chemical reaction vessel in their paper, as it beautifully illustrates the concept I am proposing. All right, next, on to the distribution of the electric fields into the West Kennet and Beckhampton Avenue systems, or as I like to call them, stone conduits. As you can see here, and I used the black and red terminals as a teaser in a previous episode that almost no one noticed to highlight the idea that this is an interconnected electrical system with a variety of structures that served multiple functions within this serpent temple landscape complex. So now let's investigate the head end of the serpent temple complex known as the sanctuary that you can see here in this 1723 depiction from William Stuckley with Silbury Hill and Windmill Hill in the distance, Avebury over here, and the body of the serpent slithering up toward the head here, which is made from a much smaller stone and wood concentric circle system the remains of which I showed in Sunday Site Visit 35. And it may have looked something like this originally. And here you can see the long stone conduit more clearly that directed the electric field into this component of the system. And it turns out that wood is also a dielectric material with a reduced capacity for storing electric fields with a dielectric constant of one to four for dry wood that can be increased by up to six times for wet wood. So essentially, the Longstone Avenue conduit system is a transformer with precisely spaced stones that reduce the extremely high and potentially dangerous electric field from the main system into a much lower electric field as it passes through the conduits 
that terminate at the sanctuary. And the reduction of these electric fields is important because the sanctuary, as appropriately named, was intended for the healing interface between the structure and the builders. All right, now that you've seen that clip explaining the function of the Beckhampton and West Kennet Stone Avenue conduits that were utilized for the step-down transformation of high-voltage currents and distribution of electric fields into other components of the Avebury Serpent Temple complex, the only way to harness the immense power of lightning is to essentially instantaneously distribute and transform the electric current. And that is exactly what was happening within the stone circle systems of England and Ireland and inside of the Egyptian pyramids. Now, let's turn our attention to the Serapium in Saqqara, beginning with some important research regarding ultrasound acoustic cavitation for the production of hydrogen. As you can see here in this paper entitled Sonication to Hydrogenization, Sono Hydrogen, describing a novel approach is here developed by the author under the name Sono Hydrogen for hydrogen production. As a matter of fact, it has been well recognized that hydrogen can be produced by introducing ultrasound waves to liquid water. As compared with the other non-renewable energy sources, hydrogen can be produced infinitely by simple means of separation from water molecules. This innovative approach is utilizing high frequency sound waves to produce hydrogen. Next, the approach here. It is an emerging technology and a combination of the power of ultrasound and the hydrogen production process when water is the liquid medium. When the ultrasound waves with high frequency pass through liquid water, it will lead to severe vibrations of water that result in generating acoustic cavitation bubbles. These extreme conditions provide an unusual chemical environment. When the collapse takes place, each bubble acts as a micro-reactor within which typical flame reactions occur. These micro-bubbles are obviously acting as micro-combustors at which a combustion chemistry or reaction takes place. Then, the collapse by the impact of the ultrasound waves leads to the formation of hydrogen molecules as illustrated in Figure 2. And we have here Figure 2, with the ultrasound probe submerged in water within the sono reactor system. The probe generates the sound waves that produce acoustic cavitation bubbles with water vapor trapped inside. The bubbles oscillate in size and collapse causing the disassociation of the water molecule, breaking it down into highly reactive radicals, hydroxide and single hydrogen, resulting in the recombination of these highly reactive radicals into H2 and oxygen. Now, I have explained in many previous episodes how the quartz containing components of these systems, for example, the acoustic catalyst antechamber of the Great Pyramid, utilize external electric fields from lightning to activate the inverse piezoelectric property to produce ultrasound waves. So the external electric field being transformed into mechanical vibrations within the quartz to produce ultrasound is a critical mechanism of operation within these systems. Once again, they are not batteries, but rather distributors and transformers of electric current and electric fields, and it always begins with the lightning strike. So recall from our recent expedition to Luxor that the Luxor 
and Karnak temples are connected via an avenue of sphinxes. And it is no coincidence that the conduits of parallel stones at Avebury are also called avenues, as these components at both sites have the exact same function. And remember this detail when we return to discuss the function of the Luxor and Karnak temples in an upcoming episode. And it turns out that we also have an avenue of sphinxes in Saqqara, or rather had past tense, as there are no traces that I'm aware of or have ever seen of this avenue of sphinxes. But you can see it here on this map from 1874. So we have the Steppe Pyramid Complex here, the Pyramid of Yusurkov here, the Pyramid of Teddy here, and the Avenue of Sphinxes connecting the Serapium here into a structure known as the Bubastion and the Northern Enclosure here. And those of you that were paying attention to that members only clip may already see where this is going. And it turns out that the Bubastion is constructed on a cliff face at the edge of Saqqara. And there was also a large outcrop of limestone bedrock within this temple that you can see here. This hill appears to have been the highest point of elevation in Saqqara, and it would be the perfect location for an obelisk. So when lightning struck this obelisk, dielectric breakdown of the stone material would occur, transforming the dielectric into a conductor, and the electrical current would be distributed throughout the bedrock of the Saqqara chemical manufacturing complex and along the Avenue of Sphinxes directly into the Serapium. This configuration is extremely similar to what we see in the Avebury Serpent Temple Complex and the West Kennet Long Barrow Ferrous Sulfate Reaction Chamber. So what was happening inside of the Serapium? This underground tunnel, chamber, and container system. And how did this structure transform that electric current? Let's start with the opening of the Serapium here. And as always, we fill the structure with water to prime the system prior to the introduction of the electric current. Now, these massive containers made of black and red granite inside of the Serapium. These containers are ultrasound generators, as are all of the containers within every structure that I have discussed thus far. For example, the containers inside of the Osiris shaft, as explained in Members Only Episode 9, are also ultrasound generators. These housings were filled with water. The electric current distributed through the avenue of sphinxes into the Serapium moved through the bedrock into the stone containers. First, this explains why these immense containers are embedded within housings sunk down into the bedrock floor within each chamber. Next, the electric field induced within the container dielectric stone matrix material by the electric current is transformed by the quartz crystal embedded in the stone into mechanical vibrations that produce ultrasound waves. This also explains why any small cracks within these containers had to be removed, as any imperfections in the container would have led to catastrophic fractures and failures when this system was activated. 
Now, as explained in the research paper regarding ultrasound acoustic cavitation with water as the medium, these high frequency sound waves break down the water and release hydrogen and oxygen. As the sonochemical reaction continues, the hydrogen and oxygen accumulate within the upper vault of the chamber housing, which is connected into this underground tunnel system with these channels carved into the roof, which you can see here, that are configured in a precise manner so that the gases can flow out of each reaction chamber and out of the system for collection and separation. So, ladies and gentlemen, my hypothesis is that the Serapium of Saqqara is a hydrogen generator that utilizes electric fields from lightning to produce ultrasound vibrations emanating from the quartz embedded containers to generate acoustic cavitation bubbles within the water that break down the molecule, allowing the isolation of hydrogen, specifically H2. And I'm going to follow up this episode with an on-site investigation of the Serapium for this week's Sunday site visit, specifically to see if we can examine this component of the structure here and to explain this entire hypothesis in detail as I walk you through the subterranean chamber and tunnel system while presenting direct evidence from within the site itself. All right, everyone, that is it for today's video. This was episode 128, The Function of the Serapium. I really hope you enjoyed today's video and in this week's Sunday site visit, an exclusive examination of the Serapium and a detailed on-site discussion of the Sono Hydrogen Generation System presented in today's episode. If this is the type of content you're interested in regarding the ancient technology of a lost civilization utilizing physics and chemistry and the function of the Egyptian pyramids and other ancient structures from across the world, this is the channel for you. Please subscribe to The Land of Chem here on YouTube so that you do not miss the new episodes that premiere twice per week. Please like, comment, share, and stay tuned if you want to help support the channel. Check out the members only channel, thelandofchem.com, and my wife, Alexa's channel, Ancient Odysseys. Link in the video description below. If you want to follow me on Instagram, my handle is at the Land of Chem. Also, don't forget, after you finish watching this video, please go subscribe to our two new channels here on YouTube, Egyptian Trash Cats, for all you cat lovers out there in Egypt, East for food reviews. Ladies and gentlemen, as always, thank you all so much for the support. I think that is it for today's episode, so I will see you. Yo, are you still watching this? Please subscribe to The Land of Chem here on YouTube and click that little notification button. New videos coming out every single week. And check out this other episode. Come on, do it. Do it now.